we're going to start off. It's really slapdash. I don't put a lot of work into sketching, but I am aware of compositional rules when I'm working. You all know the basics, you know, third rules, all the put two stripes down the middle, two stripes across, you've got four thirds, like corners in your, and all the interesting things should happen in a third, not straight down the middle, unless you're setting out to be bold and directly break the, the, the rules of composition. Um, I mean, Renoir and people like that messed with Zs and things, and I will try and lead your eye around the painting, and I'll talk about that as I'm working. But as a rule of thumb for a quick demo, stick things in the thirds of the painting. That's where your eye is expecting to find it, and it's compositionally a more pleasing thing to do. Um, I don't hold with the theory that a composition makes the painting or breaks it. I think it helps. But there's loads of other stuff you can get wrong. So, <laughs> bit of balance. Um, I'll start with a sort of mucky browny blue. Again, it's a bit of a mix, very wet, and we're just sketching. Um, not very easily. Um, I want to put a boat in it. I've got another boat here. That, they're my foregrounds. The rest are going to be blobs in the background. This headland is coming too far across, so I'm going to move it. Um, and I'll probably make something a bit out of my foreground rocks because they're quite evenly spaced at the moment and I want to say something different about them. So I am going to ride roughshod over the composition. When I'm working outside, when I'm working plein air with this rather war-beaten rig, I tend to stick more rigidly to what's in front of me. But if I'm going to take a photo home and mess about in the studio, I figure, who wants to stick directly to a photograph? Can you've got a camera for that? You know, so, um, but I know I want my boat in a third, um, sort of there. Um, my other boat is further up, smaller, further away. And then I'm going to have my horizon line in my top third. So I don't want my even rocks. I want one there and I want a couple in the side to give me a bit of breathing space down here. So yeah, two big boats, lots of little boats in the back. I hope you're writing this down. Um, and I want my, my headland to point down to here because I've got a bit more headland in the background that I'm going to make a bit more of. I do know that headland off by heart. Um, but that point there is where my things are coming down to. So I'm trying to lead your eye down to here. And then my background is going to bring you into this point as well. That is going to take me to that boat there. That boat's going to take me to that boat there. And my rocks are going to be pointing at the boat compositionally. That's a rough plan. Does that make sense? If this doesn't work, I'm going to look a right idiot in this video. <laughs> <clears throat> Let us begin. Um, so start off with a dark. Everyone know what I'm talking about values? Uh, intensity of color, tone. Um, so if you strip everything to black and white, black is your, your Right, the darkest value, white is your lightest value. Stick some more colour in it, but it's effectively the same thing. If you get the values right, the colours in the painting will sing. Okay, values does all the work, colour gets all the credit. So when I talk a lot about values, I'm looking at the balance of the painting, how dark and intense the colours are, rather than the particular colour I'm using. You can get the actual mix of colours completely wrong, but if you get the values right, then the painting should still work. I hope. Um, so again, I'm looking for my dark, so I'm going to put a little shadow under my boat just to tell me where I'm putting my boat. Sort of there. And then another one. That boat's straight on. I love sketching boats because everyone knows when you got it wrong. You see lots of really good painters fall over when they get the boat, it's great fun. Um, so this is quite dark here. This is the reflection of the headland. Now I've moved the headland, so I'm going to have to move the reflection. Okay, my head. My reflection is coming down, sort of interrupting my boat. Very, very roughly. I'm just going to scumble in where my darks and lights go. I've already knocked some power out of it with a tiny little bit of white because it's about mid distance. Okay, if I went in with black and white. And, and very bright colours, then I'm bringing that background forwards, and then I'm telling you it's at the same level as the boats, okay? So by putting black and white with things, I'm desaturating the colours and moving them further back. So when I come to my hills right in the background, I'll be sticking a little bit of blue in them, but they're mostly going to be 
very pale and I've sent them way back into the distance. So I've got to get my tone right for my, my mid headland. And leaving a, a rough hole for the boat and leaving a little bit of a space for all this browny rock. And I'm leaving a hole for the boat, but that's effectively where my where my headland and my reflection are going to go. Now we've got a really calm day here. We've got barely any wind on the water. Where it has ruffled the water up, it's knackered the reflection. Um, so surfing that across later with a little bit of bright colour is going to hopefully work. It's one of those nice little bits you leave to the end. So a little treat for the painter sort of thing. But all I'm thinking about at the moment is composition. Right, uh, we've got some big old docks. So I'm going to anchor the foreground. I have a rock there. And a cut over. This time you sort of look round and you see people's faces. What is he doing? Yeah. <laughs> If there's any point in this demo, whenever I'm watching a demonstration, there's always something that really irritates you. you think, Why isn't he doing anything about that sky? Do shout out, join in, because we're here for a couple of hours, you know. Well, there's no guarantee of this. Right, so I'm starting to build up. While my brush is doing this, my brain's doing the thinking. All your painting is about your thinking, it's about your brain. Okay, and while you see painters scratching away, they're having ideas, little thoughts that are occurring, and as the paint surfs around the canvas, the ideas can get employed and hopefully woven into the, the picture. You see all right there? I will move around so you can get a look. Um, so quite a lot of this is actually thinking time. Do you what? About. Yeah, mucking about. All the painting is mucking about. So I'm going to take a bit more of my dark and I'm just going to stick in some, again, little anchor points. Uh, French ultramarine with a bit of gunge mixed in, so a little bit of uh, crimson alizarin, a little bit of uh, burnt sienna, and it makes this sort of... I don't use black, I don't paint with black. Um, use lots of white, because I'm an oil painter, I'm allowed to. Um, but I think I can just do so much more damage with black. So I tend to mix up my own dark. And for that, I mostly use dark blues, like uh, French ultramarine. Um, if you're using your blues as blacks, your brain will read them as black. So none of these pictures here have anything other than very dark blue. Um, so your brain will tend to read very dark colors, dark blues as blacks, um, dark purples as well. And you chuck a bit of color in your shadows then which is quite important. Um, do you work with temperature of shadows, um, temperature of colours? So if you have um, your light, if your highlights are, if your lights are all warm, so oranges and yellows and reds, then your shadows must be cold. Okay, so your shadows are going to be blues and purples, etc. Standard stuff, art student stuff with the colour wheel. Uh, if you get midday sun way over the top, sometimes you'll get cold lights. So you'll end up with a cold, bluey light, in which case your shadows tend to be warm. That happens a lot in portraits, especially under shadows, under noses and chins and stuff. You get reds and oranges in your, in your uh, shadows. So that is a rule. You know, you, if you've got hot lights, you have cold shadows. Um, and you'll see a lot of portrait artists when they're first starting out, they use the same shadow value for the highlight, and then you end up with a very flat portrait, and it doesn't kind of read right, and scan right. So... Yeah, but the rules do get changed for portraiture. Today we're sticking to landscapes. Um, I'm just going to rough in some, some of my darker stuff just to give myself an anchor in the background. But I might knock this back. And this is just to tell me where the bottom of that headland is. Right, and I'm going to grab some of my King's Blue Deep, which is a very light blue. It says deep in the title, it isn't. 
Um, and I'm going to knock in this back headland. Just to tell me it's a long way away. I've already back pinned it in blue, but I've got an intensity for it now. And I can use that as a meter to know how much further forward I can bring this mid-ground, this um, mid-headland. Once you've scrubbed it and scrubbed it and scrubbed it again and got it about right, we're going to go over it with much thicker paint. But if you don't get it nailed down in the first place, then you'll be surfing over it with the wrong colours and you, that ruination lies that way. It's very easy to ruin a painting. I'll get the palette knife out later and ruin it properly for you. Right, uh, so that's my reflection. So I've got a reflection of my rocks, which is again, reflections tend to be a little desaturated. That's fine. I'm really not bothered what colour the rocks are. I'm just looking for intensity of colour, intensity of uh, value. And they've got a light side, which is quite hot. So today, light's coming from above there, so we've got a nice shadow on the gunnel. So let's just pick out the tops of the top sides of my rocks. Uh, again, I want to go a little bit deeper with that reflection. When I got that about right, we can start getting interesting with some water. So let's come forward. Mixed up this uh, thalo blue and titanium white. It mixes quite a fake looking green. I think green's one of those things in your head. Everyone sees green slightly differently. Uh, for ages, I was mixing up just very bright electric greens using um, sort of French ultramarine and cadmium yellow. It gives you this very luminous winter green. Um, I've stopped doing it now. It's starting to appear in all my paintings. I was getting quite fed up with it. So lots of different ways of doing reflections. Some of them work for different scenes. As I say, right now I'm not that interested in them. I'm going to use a bit more dark blue and find some shadows in the trees. That's a bit heavy. And I've got this interesting little rock to pull out here. And it's got a big ravine behind it. All very quiet. I'm checking you're still here. <laughs> I'm aware at this point I know what's going on and you guys don't. But um, it will start to make sense soon. Panic not. Let us start off with a drawing then. I used to. Um, and now I find. I get a bit too limited by the drawing. Um, watercolours, especially when I used to paint watercolours, used to be a lot more open to happy accidents. Oils, because you, you've got this big thick colour and you, you're not making big old heavy marks on the paper, um, I found that I, by a, a sort of a pencil sketch or a, a very knock down sketch beforehand, I, I was kind of limiting the possibilities. Um, if I keep it scratchy and just keep it moving, you find, oh, actually, I can fit something in there and that'll work. Um, whereas if you've got a drawing, that tends to, you're on a set of rails then. That's just me. There's, there's, there's no uh, higher ideal in it, you know. So whites in shadow. I've become obsessed with this, by the way. Um, whites in shadow read... <sighs> any temperature you like, but mostly light blues, light blues and purples, mucky whites. So boats in shadow, white houses in shadow, 
and I've realized I've been watching painters that get that value just right. One brush stroke and ping, it's come to life, it's real. Uh, we'll be attempting that today. If it pings, I'll let you know. I like a noisy painting. <laughs> so there is going to be a little bit of sketching going on, a slightly smaller scrubbing brush. I'm going to just draw in the line of that pilot boat there. Plymouth pilot, lovely little boat. See them everywhere. I'm a boat nerd as well. I like to go boat spotting. Right, and the reflection of that was a bit more greyed out. Right, I'm going to stand over here and have a look. I do a lot of this. My dad calls it giving it a good coat of looking at. The headland is Gillen, oh. so it's, not, it's right on the South Peninsula of the Helford yeah, River. Yes, yes, I know, yeah. You've got one, cor one corner to get round and you're there. <laughs> so the company that run all these boats is called Sail Away St Anthony. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's the little kind of hamlet, if you like, St Anthony Hamlet. And it's a magical, magical place. And they sell all my paintings, so do go there. <laughs> That's right, yeah, Durgan Head's just around the corner. And the National Trust place, yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got some lovely purples going on these rocks that I don't think I put in last time I tried something like this. So, today we'll be messing with a bit of purple. Uh, this water, the, the colours washed out in the photo. It's not much help. Uh, all skies start very blue directly over your head and they get paler and paler and paler till we get to the horizon, yeah? And then the reflection of that, very pale at the top, bluer, bluer, bluer down here, okay? If you elevate the camera, height of eye, metre and a half, you're looking down, you're going to get a bit of refraction as well, down to about 30 degrees, you get refra refraction where you can see through the water, what's happening underneath, and then about 30 degrees and outwards, it turns from refraction into reflection and the light from the sky overtakes what you can see underneath. Okay, so you can have a lot of fun looking down on water. You can see fish and things, again, very blued out, but underneath the water. And then you start to lose it and you get into that very bright blue reflection from above. And then that goes to white when you get to the horizon. Okay, get it right. It's a super painting. Get it wrong. It looks awful. So I'm going to just wash in some really high whitey blues, not quite as white as in the photo, um, and try and find a bit of that. If I can get that value of the water right, this is going to pop out. And later, when I'm using thicker paint, I'll start chopping out the reflection of my headland. Remember, your reflection of your headland has got to match your headland. You've all seen the, the paintings of lighthouses, where the lighthouse is there and the reflection's over here somewhere. And you just go, ah, it's wrong. <laughs> Very few things can you say about painting when it's truly wrong, but reflection in the wrong place is wrong. So that's probably about a mid-blue. Stick it in. Pay careful attention to where that boat's going to go. I'll leave a nail for that boat. Again, we're still mucking about with very thin paints here. I'll just put some brown in my sky. Truly professional. All right, the water out further at sea is all ruffled, so we've not got any reflection going on underneath this headland here. It may still be talking to the water. It may still have some sort of communication with it, but it's, you know, if anything, it's going to be just a, a brush stroke or two. We're not going to go to the same length of, as we would be with uh, this reflection here, which is in calm water. Um, so, as I come further up, more intense blue. That is pretty intense, probably not quite that mad. Again, scrubbing that in with my paler stuff. And that's going to be reflected down here. So that's starting to make a bit of sense now. 
she kind of closed one eye and stand at a slight angle. We started, it's got a reflection happening. And then right here, that's my, what I was talking about, reflection refractions is happening about there. So up until that line, I think I can get a bit bluer. Because most, I've got more water than sky. It's blue up here somewhere. I've not got it on the canvas. But I'm going to stick a bit of that really leery thalo in with it that's death to all composition. You know, that's not in the photo. This is, this is me playing. And then we suddenly lose all saturation because we're looking down at mud. Good old Cornish mud. Again, it's pretty high value. i uh, stick a little bit more. And I'm using my dark mix with a little bit more burnt sienna stuffed in it. I don't know how this is going to work, so I'm sketching it in. In case it's wrong. And I'm going to work on that blend there. And that's all right, I think. So again, I'm sort of working around my rocks because they're laden with a big heavy colour. I don't really want to put too much of that in the mix. But that reflection refraction point is happening about here. Now things that are closer to are going to have, still have their reflection underneath. So my rocks are still going to be reflected in that refraction point. Does that make any sense? If I'm talking to myself, let me know. <laughs> All right, have a stand back, bit of a think. Right, my boat is now too far down, so I'm going to jack him up into the sky a bit, which is the joy of not sketching things and then moving them around with sketchy paint. So I'm going to find whatever that value is. Okay. And there's no getting away with it. I'm actually going to have to draw that boat out now. need to make it smaller, it's too big. I think that's sort of working. So, uh, moving on to acrylic filibert. Filibert is the, the shape of it, that kind of rounded ended job. So you get squares, filibuts, and then round brushes. Never really have any joy with round brushes, so I mess with flat and filibut. Um, if I'm using really small detail, then I use a round brush. I don't normally carry a rigger brush because I wreck them, especially in this paint roll. Um, I've got a couple of rigger brushes in the studio, but they're expensive and they do two paintings and then they're ruined. So I'm not very kind to brushes. And they are expensive. So I'm going to stick some highlight white in. I'm probably not going to go bright white, but just to tell me where stuff's going. Right, and then the all-important shadow. Terribly bad form using the same brush for all the jobs, but it's working for me at the moment. That shadow under the transom. And now, stick a bit of reflection underneath it. Back to fiddly.
starting to carve that boat out now. Um, I'm going to have a look at this headland, this uh, mid-ground beach, because it's a very pale, high-key beach. Um, and I'll start laying a colour and just see what it looks like. That's probably a bit low-key. It needs to be a bit whiter than that. Um, just trying to work out roughly how bright it should be. And as I said, I want to put a little bit of crimson in there, a little bit of blue, and send it slightly purpley. Hopefully tell me again it's in the distance. That's this big old rock. Now, those rocks aren't reflected because the wind's come along and ruffled the water, and I want to keep that in there, I think. So I'm going to look for a bit more darker just to tell me where the crack in the rock is. Too dark. Less dark than that. Horizons need to be straight. Um, possibly the one time you can use a ruler. And you've got headlands coming towards you. Obviously a bay underneath you can be quite rounded, but things, any ellipse, as you raise it up to the horizon line, you're looking along the side of that ellipse, it becomes a line. So no matter how curved your bay, as it comes up further towards the horizon line, it's got straighter and straighter and straighter. So on the horizon, everything is straight, even if you're a flat earth believer. There's a lot of them about now on the internet, it's great. So I'm just punching some more of these shadows along the beach line, trying desperately not to make it too dark. So I'm saving that for my rocks and my foreground. Let's have a look. Go on then, what's shouting at you? What do you think? Rather ugly boat so far. I'll give it a slightly more graceful bow. So when we come in with our second lot, our second coat, if you like, we're using much wetter colours and a much softer brush and surfing over the top of this. But I'm, this is my sketch, if you like. This is this is showing me where I'm going with my my thicker paint. That's especially l later when I'm surfing big whites and heavy sort of top end colours over the top, you know, they're really going to make the, those boats zing. But if there's anything in the wrong place, getting shot of white once you've got dark colours on, you're going to mix it in and it's going to mess with the intensities of your colour and you don't really want to be doing that. So you've got to kind of be quite sure before you're being, putting big wet paint on where you're going with it. Um, I just want to do a bit more work on this foreground. Um, I'm going to finish off this Got lots of interesting purples and browns happening in the kind of sea vegetation. And again, it's getting more darker in the foreground. You now, it's all, lots of photos have this vignette effect where things get darker in the corners and around the bottom. So, lots of, especially camera phone cameras, but quite often professional photos, everything's darker in the corners coming to the centre which is brighter, especially if you're doing like large bodies of water reflections, start dark and work your way up, then it gives that illusion. Um, so I'm going to have to decide where to put this rock. How are we doing time-wise? Five. So five minutes to tea. Cool. I haven't got a watch on. Twenty-five minutes till tea. Cool. So I'm starting to panic. Now. I was thinking that's a bit early. Don't need tea that badly. Oh. punching a couple more darks shadows in my rocks, really stapling them to the sea now. I 
I'm gonna make that one in two rocks, I think. You see all right back there? Okay, that seems to be working. So I'm going to start with my flat brush now. I'm just going to start knocking in lines. So I like to use the the big sort of what's that a one and one inch brush and get a, enough flat wet paint on there, and then just bang it on, and you've got a straight line for one inch. So you can start knocking in shadows and things and working stuff out and then if it works start dragging the paint around if it doesn't work you haven't done too much damage so that I can always snatch disaster from the jaws of success so again I'm gonna get a bit of the bottom of that boat in now And look for me other boat, which is a bit higher key because it's mostly in sunlight. Well, that works. All I'm using is zest it, and I use it both as a thinner and a brush washer outer. Okay. Um, apparently, it doesn't yellow as it gets older. Um, if I'm really, really stuck, if I'm working outdoors on a cold day and I've got something I really want to dry out, um, I use this stuff which is Robertson's Glaze Medium. Uh, it's the stuff without the cobalt thinners, so hopefully we all live a little bit longer. Um, but that's really emergency. And that'll rubberize the paint. Okay, If it's got a lot of alkalids in it, if it's a, a quick drying one such as uh, French Ultramarine. Um, so the French Ultramarine, the Burnt Sienna, We'll, and we'll, we'll probably be have a skin on it tomorrow, uh, whereas titanium white will be wet for 10 days. So if you want to stick something in your paint as a, a glaze medium, I mean, there's all sorts of things out there. There's painting butter, liquid. I get in a hell of a mess, mess with liquid. I don't touch the stuff, but, um, you know, it depends on how quick or slow a painter. I like to paint everything in one hit. I'm very, very impatient. Um, so I, I tend to do a whole painting in one go. If I'm working on something larger, yeah, I'll come back to it in a day or so. But yeah, generally, you know, I'll, I'll stand there all day and do the thing in one hit. If you uh, want to come back to your oil painting lots and lots, then you've got the thick over thin to worry about. So um, if you're working at something over a series of weeks, uh, you need to put the paint on quite thin, low down, and then thicker, butterier paint further up. If the stuff underneath dries out before the stuff on the top, then you can get cracking and other disasters. Um, if you're working a la prima, wet on wet, uh, those sort of issues tend to be much less significant. Um, but if you enter a drying agent, like one of those, then you do have to start worrying about what's going to dry first and what might crack. Okay. Um, working on canvas as well, it's a flexible medium. So, you know, if you've got very thick paint on there and it's drying at a different issue, and someone pops it with a finger, you might get a crack in a big lumpy bit of paint and that'll be a disaster. Uh, so, let's have a look for... Got to remember that I'm putting blue over... I want some of that wind ruffling on it, so I'm, I've got to remember what I'm doing. So I've noticed my shadows, um, my reflections of the headland have gone a lot more ready down here, which is quite nice. I've got sort of more autumnal purples and things going on in the... It sort of works. I'm going to need to pop them in so they are being reflected correctly, but just a dab in to remind myself what I'm doing would help. And I'm going to pick out this slightly further back, this bit of headland. 
I'm using just pretty much pure cobalt for my shadows, which is about a mid shadow. Still reads as dark, but it is further away. I've knocked it further back by employing blue rather than black. But I'm still really concerned about that depth. That's that's my main issue. Let's look at the boot line of that boat. So there's not much going on on that boat at the moment because I'm going to surf over it later with a big, very high key, almost white. Okay, maybe there's a tiny bit of yellow in it. And once you've gone over that two or three times with a soft brush, you start to mix it with the things underneath and then you've lost your highlights. So you've got to be a little bit careful about that. Just sort of bearing that one in mind. Uh, and my boats in the distance are going on up here somewhere. Now this um, foreground where we're looking through is much higher key. It's a higher value than I painted it in at. So I'm going to stick much paler, mixing a lot more white with it. And I need to stand back and see how that actually reads. Ah, uh, that's starting to tell me that's water happening there. That's good. Let's chop out a rock or two. Remember to leave uh, shadow of the uh, reflection of the rock. That's looking quite wet, isn't it? That's what we want. I've got a little bit of sky going to be reflected down here. So I'm just going to suggest that to remind me where it's gone. Yeah, that'll make more sense in a minute. Right, let's have a look at that sky. Start laying that in at about the right height. Um, this is not a sky painting. We're not going to muck about with big interesting clouds and sunsets and everything. Apart from anything else, a good sunset, unfortunately, on this headland happens over the other side. So, <laughs> About 6.30 in an August evening and there's nothing. It's all gone a bit grey. It's about the only disadvantage I've found with this place. bit dead this blue. Might have to wake it up later. And let's get that pale over the horizon. Well, it's not quite a horizon line, is it? But let's chop out that headland so I know roughly where it's going. I'm using a lot more white than anything else and the gunk on the brush. No one makes a colour called gunk on the brush, but it's very useful. Not quite that, Larry. Let's take that down a bit. You are the quietest audience I've ever had. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm Brighton, born and bred. One of the six people in Brighton that was born there. <laughs> Everyone else came from, from London and bought a house. Um, yeah, I, I, I went off and travelled for teens and I worked on yachts around the world as a yacht delivery engineer. Um, I still have a lot to do with boats. I drive the Brighton lifeboat. Um, so I'm a, a volunteer on a pager. And uh, I live on a boat at the moment, which is interesting in this weather. By interesting, I mean miserable. <laughs> um, yeah, I live on a 
40 foot catamaran, big sailing catamaran, which uh, in the summer is delightful. In the winter, not so much. But, uh, the plan is to flog it and go and buy something house shaped again. Uh, my studio's on land. My studio's in the back of my parents' garage, actually, which is a uh, lovely space. And for others, it's got my dad sitting in it with a newspaper sometimes, you know. <laughs> I can do miserable things to your concentration. I've painted him a lot. He never ever agrees with the likeness. Right, so I'm going to put uh, a high key blue in and I'm going to stick this wind ruffled line in just to tell me where it's going to be in one swoop and it's going to work perfectly first time, Tony. Ugh. And it's going to work perfectly first time. I'll keep editing this till it works. There we go. That's starting to read. There's a bit of water there. I want to leave a gap in it. Got to get it up straight. You don't get bent reflections. Got a bit of a loop in it there. There we go. I think I'm going to put some highlights in those trees now. The tops of those trees are quite electric yellow. Um, so I'm going to tickle those in with a number six rosemary classic filibut. There you go. Again, we're still working with a scrubbing brush here. Um, just trying to find the intensity of colour that's going to make those trees not seem over the top. They really are luminous yellow. You've got to be a little bit careful there. There's more light on that side. We've got darker blue ear trees over here. Um, it's really easy to go overboard with your green trees. So let's just inject some saturation into the, the piece. See if it works. does need to put some colour in. Right, so, but this is kind of mixing up on the canvas. So I'm starting with my brights, which need to, I need to stick a bit more white in, to be honest. Um, but I'm just literally tickling the top of the trees in. Very easy to go over the top here. Might have to have several stabs at it. And then as you bring the brush back, you start mixing up with the stuff underneath. And hopefully you're getting all the shades in between as a bit of a 3D view. And you've got that very, very high key patch of grass on the top of that rock. Yeah, I'm just trying to find that that colour. We've got some red herrings in there as well. Stick those in. And where you've got highlights, you've got shadow. So again, I'm going back to the, that big old lump of dark value I mixed up, trying to desperately not to go too dark. And I'm just trying to pick out those shadows just to define the highlights of my trees. Now I've spent hours and hours and hours in these Cornish creeks because there's nothing but trees in most of them, especially Frenchman's Creek around those places. It's just thousands of trees coming down to the water and that's all there is. And you can spend forever doing the shadow around the trees and then the shadow around the trees. And if you're lucky, there might be an egret in it, but otherwise it's just, yeah. I'm not sure a good painting has ever come out of that, to be honest. It's one of those traps laid for painters by nature. I 
All right. Got a nice little shed, boat shed, on the beach there, and I'm going to chop that out with a bit of shadow and then pop it in later. So this really is as dark as I want to go with that shadow, though, because it is mid-ground, and I want to keep saying it's just mid-ground. All right, it's time for a suicidal slash of white just to make sure I've got the top key. Um, this is a Sea White 14 flat brush. The Sea White's really cheap flat brushes are great. I'm getting on hugely with them. Using a lot in portraiture, life drawing. They're great for just sort of blending in <coughs> highlights and high tones. I um, hope you're going to tell Sean quite what a good job I'm doing of plugging the Sea White stuff. <laughs> Right, so I've stuck a little bit of the uh, the Michael Harding Naples yellow, which is is a brown yellow, but I'm I'm mixing up a high white, and then if I can get the consistency right, um, I'm going to lay it on and find the bits of my boat, and this is going to look bright. Oh, it's not a perfect reflection. We've got a bit of ruffle going on. But, and that's going to take my colours down. And now we're looking at the blue. There's a little bit of crimson in it, but it's mostly that blue. It's the dark side of that white boat. It's where it's in shadow. Probably a bit higher key than that. Right, so that white is telling me how high the key is going to be overall. I can go quite a bit further, I think. Might wait till after tea and it's... Whereas the paint's not going to dry noticeably while you're playing with it. If you've mixed it with a bit of um, spirit of some description, that will evaporate off and it will leave stickier paint underneath. And the stickier the paint, the easier it is to surf other wetter paints over the top. So by the time of the end of this, I'll end up sticking stuff in with a, a palette knife. That's when we do the proper damage. Let's <laughs> chop out a window there. All right, and let's have a little visit of this other boat. Because it's begging for some attention. With a flat brush, if you get get your angles right as well, you can sort out your perspective in one brush stroke. If your perspective's wrong, then no amount of brush work is going to help. But just by angling it slightly, bosh, there's a roof, bosh, there's a car going in the distance. It's just a lot quicker. It's not always right, but... And I think we're going to put a little bit, I'm going to make a boat there and there. 
There we go, it's starting to really sort of bring that out a bit. I now need to say a bit more about the uh, shadow on that boat, I think. Uh, it's a lot of cobalt blue I'm seeing down the side of that, but again, it's a much higher key than the shadow behind it. So let's just rattle that in, leaving the windows dark for now. Just making sure the boat is right. How are we looking? That's starting to work. I like that. Okay, I need to look at this line. Line of my shadow down here a bit. Um, I'm going to do it completely wrong way around. I'm going to start. I'm going to put my reflection in first and then make the trees match. I don't care, I'm a maverick. Uh, so again, that value is working. I don't, I don't want to go too overboard, but it's going to look more intense because it's going to be bigger wet of paint over the top. So a little bit of mucking around getting that intensity right. I think that's all right. All right big old strokes with a flat brush up and across and bingo, you've got reflection. That will cheat. So the more I chop that reflection out, the more that's going to bring this boat into the foreground. And you can keep surfing colours because I'm still not using thick paint. Uh, gunge. <laughs> yeah, with hint of mess. Yeah, see that boat? Bang! There we go, we have a boat in the foreground. Right, so now I'm starting to look at this edge. I'm picking up the white, got to be a little bit careful of that. Um, so one thing you can do if you want to sort of, if you've got ages to spend is start to draw out your reflections. Very my ripples have got a match. So you can uh, you can create a real rod for your own back with these. Never paint your fingers. <laughs> I'm going to bring some of this forward value and start looking at the weed on the water and see just if that works as an idea, really. Oh, that's fun. I like that. Yeah. That's a noisy bit of painting. Um, so let's have some of those high yellows on there because we've got some of those lovely high greens. I'm going to drag one or two of those down in correlation to the paints. Uh, probably not that green. It's horrible green. Let's bring a bit more yellow with it. That looks a bit better. That's better. I like that. Right, and I'm going to sort of look at the intensity of the stripe that's a third back, so just behind the cabin of my boat. Bearing in mind, I'm going to cover a lot of the rest of it up with uh, that ruffled wind water stuff. That'll be the first half then. Right, one of the things I've been sort of wandering around and uh, enjoying my biscuits, um, I've decided that I want to bring the sky up a little bit. I don't really want to take this down anymore. Obviously, I want to put a bit more colour into it because it's still muddy. Um, but I want to um, take this sky up in key a bit more, up in value, so that it really cuts out that background and makes the foreground pop a little bit more. Uh, so I've mixed up a couple of uh, light blues. I'm just going to try one on there. So, again, going a lot higher key than I th was thinking earlier. But I'm hoping that's going to make it even more watery. See what I'm trying to do there? So. It's 
especially out here where we've got a lot more light kicking around and it's reflecting the sky so I've got a cap full of clean terps which is probably quite a good idea to use when you're um, Yeah, starting to pop that water out a bit more. So we're going quite thick now. So I've got my uh, I'm thinning the paint down and I'm using my soft brush so I can bring those. Bring that thick paint in. Bear in mind, I'm aware it's getting bluer the further down I go. I don't want to interfere with that, but this new policy of bringing that water out. So I've got a slightly more bluer blue mixed up here. Try and get some on the brush. Let's have a look. Where are we? There we go. Started chopping that water out nicely. Now I'm sort of blending that in where it, where it's working in the water. Bit of blending. Beware the blenders. I'm bringing my reflection surfaces down a bit more. You know what I mean by blending when you go over and over until you end up with a nice soft edge. And occasionally, if you do it in a bit of water or a bit of shadow and you put a blend in, you think, oh, it's amazing, so you do a bit more. Oh, so, oh, great, a bit more blending. And then you, before you know it, you've blended the whole picture and you end up with a biscuit of a painting. You know. <laughs> Beware the blenders, all right? And a very good friend of mine was, uh, was wandering around an art show with her. Um, and uh, we looked at this beautiful cloudscape, just a giant cloudscape on a canvas, and we we're both looking at it. And it was all blended, this massive cloud. But it was very theatrical, it was beautiful. And she just went, oh, she's a blender, and walked on. I said, oh. <laughs> all right, don't be a blender. But I do like, a bit of blending's all right. Just be sparing with it. It's like thalo. Maybe a little bit after dinner, no more. All right, so this, I want to get that turquoisey colour in the ruffled water. I'm going to use some of my thalo in that. This may well be a disaster. I'm going to do it anyway. Oh, it's blue. It's lovely. <laughs> there we go. Try and leap a bit of colour in there. There's another little. Oh, I love a bit of colour. All right, let's just sort this sky out because I've just left it as a chunk. So with this sloppy thick paint, I'm going to cut out a bit more of my trees. Because I'm using a soft thick brush with quite runny paint, it's not picking up the greens. <coughs> no one wants a green sky. Don't get green skies in nature. So, um, especially if you're messing with sunsets, which fortunately we're not today. Lots of yellow and oranges in skies. The rest of the sky is blue, you've all done it. Yellow touches the blue, bing, green sky. There's no getting away from it. I mean, no matter how much you try and scrape it off or whatever, you've got a green sky. 
a layer of white in between with a little bit of brown or red in it. And that's a, like your buffer to stop you getting a green sky. It's a different demo. Oh, next one you want to do portraits. Portraits is fun. Need a sitter for them, but it is a giggle. Bearing in mind I'm a caricaturist, I'm not safe with portraits. <laughs> right, so I'm going to stick some, some lumps in there. And now I'm popping my trees in. Now the trees are different makes of tree. Makes of tree? <laughs> this is the Ford tree. Um, different models of tree. Um, so they break up and they cause different silhouettes. So don't be doing the same technique for all your trees. We're just after a suggestion of tree. And the further away they get, the less broken the light gets into the trees. I want to stand over here, have a look at it. There you go, that's woken it up a bit, isn't it? That thalo streak needs to carry onto the boat, though. Right, start, let's start having a look at that beach behind. Again, I'll stick with my big flat brush because it's working quite nicely. Don't normally sort of wash the brushes out and clean them out. I try not to do it very much because then you, you end up with a load of terps or thinners in your brush and it starts to work out during the painting. It starts to dilute your paint a bit more than you were planning on. So be a little bit careful with it. But I'm going to mix up a colour for my beach now. So, quite a lot more titanium white. I've got some of that mucky grey brown that mixed up earlier. But I've got a little bit of um, orangey, ready sienna going on in it. Because it's quite high key, I'm just going to surf a bit of that in, see if it starts to work. That's not high enough. Use a palette knife, that can never go wrong. Palette knives are all right for pushing paint around. It's when you start using them on the painting, as I will do later, that you, uh, you run the risk of it going hideously awry. Can undo a day's work with a palette knife in moments. Right, let's try that. That's very high key, but let's give it a go. That doesn't actually look wrong. Um, I think it's possibly a little bolder than I was thinking of, but actually it's sort of working, so we'll stick that one down as a happy accident and keep on with it. <coughs> right, let's have a look at some of these rocks. Again, I want to get that. Might be a bit bright for those rocks, but we'll have a go. I think that's a bit leery. Let's have a look where the light's hitting those rocks, because that's defining the shape of the headland. There's a little bit of purple. Crimson alizarin is a really beefy colour. It's got, once you, you think, I'll stick a little bit in there, give myself a slightly purple rock, and then suddenly you've got a bright red rock. So, be a little bit cautious with it. Oh, 
How's that reading? It's starting to look rocky. It's not too far forward, which is what I was worried about. I didn't want to bring it too far forward. So, let's... Bring a bit of that quite bright green into the top just to and then we got sort of there's like a beautifully manicured lawn that runs along the side there. It's like a little national trust path, it's gorgeous. Take a canoe over there of an evening. Generally, we have disastrous barbecues on that rock. I'm not one of life's barbecuers. I try, but it never works. All right, so I've got my slightly softer filibut brush. I'm just going to tickle in the tops of those trees now. So again, it's not precise. I'm being really careful because I'm aware that I can go too leery too quickly. I might have to knock these back. So remember desaturating sends it back. So a bit more white with it makes it less leery green. The more detail also you put in, the more it brings it forward again. I don't want you looking too carefully at these trees because they're behind, they're in the background. So there's literally just enough information in there to tell you, okay, it's definitely a tree. No whispering at the back and spit your chewing gum out. Right, so now I've got those colours in there, I'm going to start just hinting at them in my, in my reflection, but I'm going to switch brushes because I'm trying, by cunning use of brush stroke, I'm sort of saying that it's in reflection. That's sort of working. There we go, starting to talk a bit. Slightly noisier. Yeah, all right. All right, let's just sort out that uh, distant headland. It's way too far up. So we've, within the blueness, we've got a... Uh, my distant headland is all going to be variations of blueness because I want it to stay in the background. So we've got a little cliff hanging off the bottom of it. And then we've got a line uh, which is still just cobalt blue. So it's further away. And from that, I'm going to take my very pale sea mixture. I'm not being too careful about where I stick that because I'm going to stick some boats over it. And if I get it too wet and sloppy, it's going to be really difficult to get boats to sit on it. And you end up paddling around in acres of wet paint. We've got some really dark blues just sitting under the cliff. And whereas I've not gone dark on the cliff, I'd quite like to just say that like, there's some greeny blue shadows there. So I'm going to take some of my green mixture and I'm going to try and surf it in on the top of the blue. Too much, too much, too much. Calm back. And slightly more control than I'm showing at the moment. That sort of gives that a bit of a base. It's got to stay flat though. 
zwei. Got a lip. Don't want that lip in it. All right. I think the rest of that we're going to cover up with boats anyway. Uh, let's just stick a bit of those trees in with a soft filibut again, because that's still initial sketch. Brush is just wandering around. Uh, I quite like those ready crimson colours in the in the trees. I know from experience they're miserable colours to mix, but I'm going to have a crack at them. They're really quite dark and I don't want to bring that forward again. I'm sort of being really careful now to leave that headland where it is. So just maybe rubbing a bit of crimson into it. And then of course remember to bring it down in the shadow as well. Just so that I remember to include it. All right, let's have a look at these rocks. Start with the shadows. Now, we're foreground rocks, so we've got heavy, heavy shadows. They're all covered in weed, which doesn't help. Weed's miserable stuff to paint. Remember, these are compositional rocks, it's a special kind of rock. Right, there's a lot more weed in this picture than I'm putting in. I'm going to, I'm going to drill some weed in in a second, but not as much as there is in the picture. And what I want to do is find myself... So you've got a very thick heavy duty reflection under the rock, but it is slightly desaturated from the actual rock. So I'm um, being really careful with my value just to make sure, okay, I've got a good reflection of rock, but it's not, it's definitely under the water at that point. So I can then find the top value, which is this much brighter stuff not quite as bright as the beach behind, but it's close. So let's take half of that. And because it's weed, it's going to be blobs and dashes. It's not going to be a big flat brush job. But again, those high values where the sun's hitting the top, once the weed dries out, it goes quite matte. But it's always a lot paler than you think it's going to be. And some of the rocks where there's no weed on it, it will shine a lot brighter. So that one there, for instance, it's got an edge on it. So let's try and capture that. How are they looking? <coughs> so I'm going to get that. It's got a much reddier colour, sort of reddy brown colour. Going in with my weed. And it's all about getting that weed the right shape, right shade. it's in the foreground it can go up and down as well to a certain extent so I can use it to point at things I'm using a flat brush for this
I mean, weed floats on the surface, you just get the top bit. So certainly a couple of yards out from the viewer. It's gone completely horizontal and it's always flat from that point out. Just directly below you, you're allowed to do it going up further. But as the same rule with horizons, the further away from you it gets, the flatter it gets. There we go. Definitely a tad light. And let's get some light on the weed. How was the demo? Well, this bloke turned up and he just sort of talked about weed for hours. <laughs> I'll go and say something. <laughs> I know you don't enjoy watercolours, but do you enjoy watercolour or I started with watercolours. Um, I found the propensity of happy accidents to be larger. Um, to be honest, a little bit of it was a commercial decision. Um, at the time, I felt that uh, you know I was, I was looking at some excellent watercolours in the local galleries. They didn't seem to fetch such a high price, um, and I do do this for a living. <laughs> so. So yeah, that, that was definitely a consideration. Um, but I was doing uh, artist impressions for building companies, developers, before uh, modelling software came and stole that one. And uh, so I was doing quite a lot of it. And in the end, it was feeling like real work. Um, and I've always worked digitally a lot. All of my portrait work for the city is, tends to be corporate digital work. So the need to go and splash around in some paint to let off steam is uh, quite overwhelming. I found oil to be messy enough. I did a lot of acrylics as well. So all my early portraits are in acrylics, but then I found the drying time used to get a bit oppressive. You get a nice colour going on, and you come back after a cup of tea, and it's, a, it's got skin on it. That's the end of it. You've got to mix it up again. So oils, they stay wet for ages. And I've sort of settled here for a bit, really. And that value thing doesn't go away. You know, the whole people pay more for oil paintings. I mean, there's certainly no difference in skill, but it's a commercial thing. So um, sitting at a computer, you have a sort of digital breadboard. And as you move, you've got a stylus that's pressure sensitive like a pen, but you're looking at the screen and you're drawing on the board. So the harder you push, the fatter the line gets, and you can set it up to behave just like your, your paints. You can mix on the screen, you can pick a colour up and drop a colour, and you don't have any of this uh, taking colour up from underneath or having a mucky brush. So you, you can go a lot faster. Um, and if you're working for you know, images that are going to go straight to print or they're going to go straight on a website, there's no need for an original because you'd have to photograph it and then manipulate it before they could use it anyway. Whereas, you know, if I'm doing a composition with 25 people in it, I say, actually, he needs to be over there. <laughs> All right? <laughs> you know, it's a lot more freedom. It's pretty soulless work. And there's now a generation of artists coming up that are purely digital artists. Um, and it brings a lot of pitfalls with it, you know, because um, you... <sighs> You come up with this beautifully rendered, almost photorealistic finish, but your anatomy's still out. You've still got a shoulder up here, or the perspective's wonky, or 
you know, all the old-fashioned rules of drawing still exist. And uh, you, you, see, you, you find a lot of this finely rendered digital art and the bones underneath that, you know, you should have learned in school aren't there. So, uh, yeah, I used to teach digital painting and people used to come back and I used to send them away with a pen and a bit of paper and say, you know, go and learn your perspective and go and do some life drawing classes and get people's bodies and limbs in the right places and then we'll mess with the digital stuff afterwards. People get very dazzled by the, the, the speed and the, 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 the ease with which you can get those, you know, the, the, those wonderful renders and glossy finishes, but the, the bones underneath it aren't there. God, I sound like an old art teacher, don't I? Um, go back to school, learn to do it properly. But I was just as bad as everyone else, you know. I, I, when I started painting, I, I, know, I, was, I was going on courses and I was going to, you know, study with artists in different countries and things. And uh, you'd find out, actually, you know, my 101 perspective is just letting me down there. I should have learned this in the... If I'd gone to art school, I would have learned that in the first week, I guess. But, you know, I chose to do it the difficult way, so I had some painful lessons. Yeah, I'm not trained. <laughs> you were trained engineer, you were saying. Well, those that taught me the engineering would laugh at that, but yes. <laughs> I was a dreadful engineer, but I did enjoy myself. All right, I'm just going to cut that boat out, so I'm picking up some more of my C value. And I'm just, by chopping it out, I'm hoping to do most of the work that would be involved in actually drawing the boat. Yeah, I've been woefully inadequate on the, uh, on the, uh, qualifications front. I'm a trained panel beater. <laughs> I don't know how I managed that. That was an odd job. Oh, and I'm a search and rescue commander. <laughs> if you get lost on the way home, I'm your man. <laughs> now I'm a lifeboat commander. Oh. Dogs aren't a lot of use on a lifeboat. <laughs> what happens when you're away from home? Well, at the moment, it's a bit of a disaster because um, we've not got uh, enough lifeboat drivers. So normally on Brighton, we've, we've got an inshore boat and we run with uh, five drivers. We're down to three at the moment, but I think someone's holding the fort tonight. You have to go out in all weathers, I suppose, don't you? We do indeed, yeah. It's more fun that way. Sometimes, sometimes it's freezing and miserable. Yeah, the good denizens of Brighton come in all shapes and colours. So, uh, yeah, that's what we'd like you to think. Happy Christmas. I send them their Christmas present. That's right, yeah. Brighton Marina. It's just been built a new station, so we're uh, learning all of its interesting foibles at the moment. We've been in a sort of makeshift porter cabin for about four years, I think. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to have a building. All right, I've just been chopping out that little boat. Still looking a bit skew if on the top of the cabin. So. Boat perspective will get you going for hours and hours and hours. Thing is, boats haven't got any right angles on them. So it's, it's very easy to get all the angles wrong. When you think you're halfway there, quit while you're ahead. Right, what I want to do quite quickly, and this is where it's all going to go horribly wrong. Um, I haven't got the right knife with me. I'll try and do it with this flat brush instead. How we, so how long have we got? A couple of minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes? Alright, let's just...
pop in some of the fun bits on the tops of the boats. I don't varnish them unless they're going to sit in a kitchen. Um, you have to wait six months before you varnish your painting. And uh, if I've kept it for six months and not sold it, I'm going to live living. Um, if it's got a lot of browns or darks in it, but I find that all the big disasters can generally be attributed to varnishing. Um, so you get cracking, you get reactions underneath, you can have all sorts of, yeah, I've had a couple of go properly wrong. Um, so Varnishing too soon, um, wrong sort of alkalids in the varnish. Um, yeah, I've had a couple react with, with I changed brands of paint. So, yeah, I'm, a, I'm very nervous about varnishing. I prefer not to do it where possible. Uh, most of the galleries don't insist on it anyway. So I'm just going to bash in some boats very quickly in the background, just catching the bright whites. And we're going to start populating this, uh, this creek because it is a busy creek in summer. Go out there in winter and there's nothing sitting out there but a load of marker boys. And there's a few dings of colour going on in there that I want to feature just before we run out of time. So we've got those very, very luminous, bright life ring on top of the boat. I quite like the colour that's giving off and I'm hoping to sort of stick a bit of reflection in there on it as well. And, and then I'm going to desaturate it slightly just by mixing some gunge with it and make sure it's directly under the thing it's reflecting. And we've got a couple of Reds further away, I'm going to mix a bit of crimson so they're not quite so leery. So there's one over there. And then I've got lots and lots of these markers. I've got a nice bit of yellow on the front of that one. I want to take that shadow back a bit. And then the last thing I'm going to put in is some masts. Um, just to give myself a bit, a bit of vertical. I'll stick some green in. I've got some quite yellowy green going on in the, the foreground there. Uh, small knife, smallish knife. Uh, Covered in gunge. Just sticking some masks in. And where I've got reflection going on, I'm going to need a desaturated mast underneath. I'm trying to avoid getting the reflection in the ruffled water but in the smooth water. It's going to need a bit, and then I've got that little cottage thing shed in the background. Just a hint of that. I'll do. 
and some of my blue for the shadow value on those boats. Right, have we got any more of those rocks to tidy up? A couple more dark shadows just as well as the base of those rocks. And I'll stand back. <coughs> Let's have a little bit more. I am going to stick a cloud in it. Bear in mind, if you're going to stick a cloud in it, it's got to talk to the reflection as well. So this is going to be a very indistinct cloud. But I just need to pop this out a little bit. So I'll put a little bit of that uh, yellowy rock colour in. Make sure something's said in the reflection about it. Anything else you want to change? <laughs> right, I'm going to call that one done then, guys. Thank you very much. Cheers.